Dr. C. Devi, we can start. <coughs> Dr. C. Devi, you're muted. You'll have to unmute and start the meeting. Yeah. Dr. C. Devi, you have to unmute. Yes. Yeah. Right ahead. You're ready to go. Uh, namaskaram. And it's, it's a warm welcome from all of us from Andhra Pradesh to all of the people who have logged in for our first CME program. And it's a heartful thanks from all of us to Dr. Kurana sir and Dr. Praveen sir for giving us this opportunity and for giving us a special regional chapter for the state of Andhra Pradesh. So you people gave your valuable time on your weekday. This is like a big encouragement for us and a kickstart to start our educational programs. And we will be doing these programs regularly as scheduled. And we plan to do it every third Friday. And it's a big responsibility, I think, uh, you people gave uh, me uh, and the other executive committee members to take forward the mission of uh, Society of Fetal Medicine. And at this onset, I would like to request all the members uh, who are practicing fetal medicine from here forward to come and uh, give your interesting cases. So every month, uh, the programs we will be encouraging the local people to do the to be the participants in the next coming programs. And uh, it's a great honor that the teachers like you have actually. Uh, I don't have words to say, but it, it, it's you accepted to do our first program. We are really thankful, sir. And uh, I would like Dr. Narayan Rao, sir, to introduce our team of the uh, AP chapter. And I would I, I thank our mentors, Dr. Subraju, sir, Dr. Radha, madam, and Praveen, sir, for being with us. Thank you so much. And I would like now uh, Narayan Rao, sir, to introduce our team members to all of you before we start the program. So how to share the PPT, madam? Just come here or just you are going to share? Dr. From... Gayatri, uh, she'll be sharing the slides, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, all. First, let me thank the, uh, our godfathers of SFM. Uh, Dr. Purana sir, Dr. Praveen sir, and Bimal sir, and Naveen uh, Mittal. And uh, uh, I, I thank our president, Dr. Sri Devi madam, for giving me this opportunity to introduce our new team of Andhra SFM. Uh, first, I, I will introduce Dr. our president, dynamic and very good teacher, Dr. Sri Devi madam. And she's a consultant in Penakil's Women's Imaging Center, Vizag. And she's a director of uh, Hyandanol Ultrasound Training Program South and Foxy Ultrasound Training Programs. And she's fellow, uh, she's fellow in fetal medicine and diploma in, she, she, had, she did diploma in advanced optic ultrasound and diploma in fetal invasive procedures. And she is the president, I am the vice president, and I need not tell myself, <laughs> I, uh, everybody knows about me, I think. I am Dr. Narayan Rao. I am from Palakal. I am a consultant across uh, uh, And our dynamic secretary, Dr. Madhavi Lata, is MD gynecologist. She did in uh, JIPMA. As I'm just I'm getting the slides. And she's a clinical director and consultant in fetal medicine, Bishak Fetal Medicine Center, Vijayawada. And she uh, she awarded gold medals in MD Animal and a prize for fetal medicine genetics award at 26th ACC RCOG annual conference. And she presented so many papers on, and she was the organizing secretary of SFM Museum chapter number 2018 and son of June 2019 Museum. And Dr. Savitri 
Dr. V. Swagatri, madam. She is consultant at Sri Krishna Health Center, Visayakapatnam. She has done DLB and MS Gynic, MS Optical Gynic. She did fellowship in Optic Ultrasound from MediScan Chennai under Dr. Suresh Sir. She did fellowship in laparoscopy in 2018, presented papers in state and national conferences. Next, Dr. Gayatri Inla is MS postdoctoral fellowship in fetal medicine, MediScan system. And she, she is a director and consultant in fetal medicine. She the Lotus Ultrasound and Fatal Care Center, Karnul. And she has so many academics, participated in research work and the Indian Council of Medical Research, presented at regional, regional and national conferences. And she, she has published publications in so many journals. And next, uh, Dr. Raghasutha, senior consultant in obstetrician in Birthright by Rainbow Hospitals. And she was a giant secretary. OG, OGSV and Secretary OGSV received Best Doctor Award in 2006, co -ed, co editor of two books. And Dr. Murunali Rao, she is a consultant radiologist in Elud and uh, she worked in, uh, as assistant professor in Nasrim Hospital and uh, Elud and means she, she had special interest in fetal medicine. Next, Dr. Swazi, Swazi sir, she, uh, he's a, uh, he is a retired from government service as a specialist civil assistant surgeon in rural area of Andhra Pradesh. She had experience in optical ultrasound for 16 years, and his area of interest is fatal imaging. Next, Mansu Madhuri, she is a consultant fatal medicine unit, Medicover Women and Child Hospital Vizag. She is running own scan center since the last eight years. She, she was trained in fetal medicine at MediScan. She had fellowship in Gynic Ultrasonic Rookie from Gynic Academy. And she presented papers in state and national conferences. Dr. M. Anuradha, she is consulted in Vedanta Hospital, Guntur. She perceived MS Gynic from SV Medical College, Tirupati. And she presented papers and posters in state and national conferences. She has done fatal medicine in Fernandez Hospital, Hyderabad. Dr. Rani Roja Paila is fellow in obstetric ultrasound. Uh, he is a fatal medicine consultant at JSA Hospital, Vizag, and Parvati Puram. She, she trained in obstetric ultrasound, SRMC, Chennai. She had publications in national journals and presented several papers in national and international conferences. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Ma'am, can I go ahead with the introduction of our chairpersons, please? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, a very good evening uh, to uh, everyone present here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege. I'd like to uh, extend a warm welcome to our uh, chairpersons who have uh, agreed, uh, in spite of their busy schedules, have agreed to be with us today. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Ma'am, can you see uh, the screen? No. 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 I think you need to share the screen. Sir, I am already sharing my screen. It was seen earlier, guys. Right now, we are not sharing. Share sharing. and share again. Sorry, sir. Stop sharing and then share again. Okay, sir. And uh, now, I think, yes. You know, we have gone back. Yes, now you... Is it fine now, sir? Yes, good. Uh, so first, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. K. Superaj, sir. Uh, he has been a former uh, additional director of medical education and professor and HOD of, uh, uh, um, of scan department at Andhra Medical College and civil surgeon at KGH, Vizag. Uh, and uh, he's a, a veteran uh, gynecologist who has been an active member 
of various associations and uh, also has been a president of the Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of WISAC. And uh, he has trained in uh, endoscopic procedures and also he's a life member of the Society of Fetal Medicine. And uh, he's uh, um, had many publications and uh, edited many books also. Um, part of uh, them are uh, a practical handbook of obstetric emergencies and practical handbook of intrapartum care. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Next, we have Dr. Radha Tatapudi. She is the professor in HOD at uh, Geetam University. And uh, she has um, a lot of, uh, uh, held a lot of executive positions in various conferences and also occupied uh, uh, various uh, positions in uh, in. Uh, obstetrical and gynecological societies and uh, she has been an organizing member sorry sorry she has been an organizing uh, secretary in various national and state conferences and uh, her fields of interest are uh, uh, especially preeclampsia eclampsia and medical disorders in pregnancy and also uh, endoscopy and gynecology she has to her credit uh, various publications in uh, uh, journals regarding the uh, pregnancy hypertension and uh, she has edited textbooks and contributed to chapters in uh, uh, pertaining to books on uh, obstetric emergencies intrapartum care and uh, she has been a reviewer of journals uh, various journals and contributed to various articles a uh, very warm welcome to you ma'am uh, next we have uh, dr sajana Gogineni. Uh, she is a professor and HOD at uh, Dr. Pinam Neni Siddhartha Institute of Sci uh, Health Sciences and Research Foundation. She had trained in ultrasound in Switzerland and uh, she has to her credit many uh, uh, publications in various national and international journals. She has conducted several workshops, uh, especially on vaginal hysterectomy, infertility and management of uh, PPH. And uh, she has got uh, selected for BJOG finalists for the research work in anemia in 2017. And she has authored many, many uh, books, especially in uh, endocrinology in obstetrics and gynecology. And again, in uh, placenta and hormonal changes in pregnancy. Uh, so again, I uh, welcome uh, each and every of our uh, chairpersons uh, to be present here with us and to chair this particular session. Welcome you all, ma'am. Welcome, sir. I now request uh, Dr. Radha, ma'am, to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker for the special session, please. Uh, thank you. Good evening. First of all, uh, I congratulate the uh, president of uh, AP Society of Fetal Medicine, Dr. Sri Devi. Thank you, ma'am. And her team for starting the uh, AP chapter of Society of Fetal Medicine. And uh, I am happy to participate in the inaugural meeting of AP Society today. And uh, it's a privilege that national leaders in the field are here to speak uh, to us today. And I feel it a privilege to introduce Dr. Bimal Sahani, who is a national president of Society of Fetal Medicine. He is currently director of Sonoscan Center, Aurangabad, and he is academic coordinator, scholar, MD fetal medicine training program, and he is a specialist in radiology, and he co-authored second trimester guidelines of the Society of Fetal Medicine, and he is the principal author of first trimester guidelines of the Society of Fetal Medicine, and he co-authored Society of Fetal Medicine India oriented guidance statement for ultrasound establishments during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, he, uh, of course, he is a faculty at various national and international conferences. And his main areas of interest are fetal growth and Doppler and fetal echocardiography. And today he will speak to us on sonographic spectrum of ventriculomegaly, all we need to know. We are eager to know, sir, Please speak. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radha. Thank you for those kind words of introduction. At the very onset, uh, I would like to congratulate the complete team of Andhra SFM uh, for 
you know atlas having their own chapter and uh, and to you know the moment uh, the chapter was formed the, i think you are the first chapter to begin academic activities and uh, really really happy to see that uh, you know there is so much of an enthusiasm for uh, academic activities here and i'm looking forward to a lot of uh, great academic stuff coming from this group uh, with this i'll just share my screen and uh, so uh, my topic today is the sonographic spectrum of ventricular megaly all we need to know very honestly speaking there is so much to know about it uh, so i don't think uh, i would be able to do uh, you know will uh, will be able to tell all that we need to know but definitely what is the bare minimum that we want to know and we all should know i'll be able to cover up in the next 20 minutes now primarily what is ventricular megaly it's it's a very common if you look at all the brain uh, findings you will find that it is the most common abnormal fetal cerebral finding now uh, please uh, you know uh, just see what word i am using i am not saying that it is the most common cerebral anomaly i am saying it's the most i'm using the word finding because it is actually a finding but then it is seen in 0.3 to 1.5% of all fetuses at mid gestation it is not an anomaly per se it is actually what it is doing is this finding tells us that there is a possibility of associated anomalies which could be within the brain or it could be outside or there could be an association with chromosomal anomalies or infections and you know the male to female uh, if you look at the incidence then it is 1.7 is to 1 now how do we define ventricular megaly there has been uh, you know we've gone through a lot of different stages where different uh, the, the, you know definitions have been used but there is one universal consensus now that we will define ventricular megaly when the axial diameter of the atrium of the ventricle the you know the atrial width is greater than or equal to 10 mm now normally the atrial width is around 7.6 plus or minus 0.6 mm so 10 mm actually is three standard deviation so Uh, you know anything which is equal to or greater than 10 mm is what we will label as ventricular megaly now we used to use this that there is a separation of 3 mm of the choroid you know choroid plexus from the medial wall now that actually now does not fit into the definition but that definitely helps you in subjectively seeing that there is something wrong there and then uh, go ahead and do the measurements the first and foremost thing that one needs to do is to confirm whether ventricular megaly is in fact present the at least 50% of the patients who are referred to me for a mild ventricular megaly actually do not have a ventricular megaly at all because so that is the it's very important that we need to follow an a, a clear cut criteria when we are about to measure so you need to have the head in an axial plane the image should be magnified so that only the head is seen the focal zone should be at the appropriate level and then you should be able to see the atrium and the occipital horn very clearly and when you have this you need to measure the the lucent part so you need to use the plus calipers and you take it from on to on so you need to measure only the uh you know the the lucent part that you see there it is not outer to outer it is not outer to inner so this actually is the true measurement of the lateral ventricle the atrial width once you have the atrial width you need to classify whether it is a mild ventricular megaly a moderate or an overt or severe and for that in between for a few years we had gone back to 10 to 15 as mild and greater than 15 as overt but then the current literature in the last 3 3 4 years has again been telling us that let us classify them as 10 to 12 as mild 12 to 15 as moderate and greater than 15 as overt or severe ventricular megaly because the outcomes with a 10 to 12 and 12 to 15 are a little different and so we go back to our old classification 
which is 10 to 12 as mild, 12 to 15 as moderate, and greater than 15 millimeter as overt or severe ventriculomegaly. Then you have to think of what all could, as I said, it is just a finding. So it is telling, it is the starting point. It is telling me that I need to look further. So what, what all things, you know, what is the etiology which will help me go ahead with my examination? Now, the most common of them is associated CNS structural anomalies. So you can have the Dandy Walker continuum, carry to malformation, aqueductal stenosis, urgenesis of corpus callosum, a lot of other CNS anomalies would present with ventriculomegaly. Hence, I, I don't think there is any CNS anomaly which would not be an you know, which could not be an association with ventriculomegaly. Hence, you need to go ahead and look at the brain in great details. Then we know that it could be associated with fetal infections like the toxo, toxo the CMV, papovirus, Zika, aneuploidies, and other genetic associations. And then it could be a part of syndromes. Now, once we have the etiology in mind, then we think, how am I going to approach this? So first and foremost, I'm going to look for other intracranial abnormalities. Then I will look for intracranial findings, which could then suggest a possibility of infection or hemorrhage. I would look for extracranial anomalies, the soft markers of aneuploidies. Then the next step would be to plan further investigations. And the last thing is counseling the patient. So this is how we need to approach this. So first we will begin with, you know, you know what are CNS anomalies or findings that you need to look for. So first, if you want to look for them, you should know what, how we are going to go about examining the brain. So we have our basic evaluation where we have the three axial planes that we look into the transthalamic, the transventricular and the transcerebellar. But once you have a ventriculomegaly, you can't stop your examination here. You have to go ahead and do an extended neurosonogram. And for that, you need to follow certain guidelines and you have the ESOA guidelines. So that you know, covers up, we, we, we see a mid-sag, two parasag, and the coronal planes. Now, the mid-sagital plane is the most important of all this. You need to get the, a perfect mid-sag because this is going to help me in making the, the diagnosis of midline abnormalities and also of the posterior fossa because I'm, I'm going to see the corpus callosum, I'm going to see the vermis, and you have a lecture on posterior fossa, you will realize that all diagnosis on posterior fossa is actually done on the mid-sag view. And then of course you can use the pericalosal artery to, uh, you know, for confirmation of that, yes, this is, you are at the right plane and you've got the corpus callosum well. Then you need the parasag views because the parasag views give you the complete look at the ventricles. You can see the border of the ventricles. You can see the choroid plexus. You are able to appreciate the fluid within the lateral ventricles, whether it is clear or it is turbid or there are any other things. You can see the cerebellar, the cerebral surface there and the subarachnoid space. And then we have the four coronal planes, the transfrontal, the transcordate, the transthalamic, and the transcerebellar. Now, every plane, you, you, there is certain thing that you can look for. And that is why your complete spectrum of evaluation is going to include your mid-sag, your two parasag, and the coronal planes. Well, you know, if it is a trans, if it is in a, uh, uh, a vertex presentation, the best thing is to go ahead and do a transvaginal to get all these wonderful. And with the transvaginal, you can get such wonderful images that you don't require an MRI. And then, if, but if it is in a rich presentation, then you, you can go transfrontal and then go ahead and get all these views. And then there is a huge checklist that you have to look for. I don't have time to go through all these, but then I will speak to you only on certain specific things. So first and foremost, I start with, when I look at the head, the biometry is the first thing that I do. So biometry itself at times gives me a clue because the biometry may tell me that, yes, okay, the head perimeter is looking very, very small. It is falling less than two standard deviation or three standard deviation below the mean. 
At the same time, when I look at the cranium, I may see some defects in the cranium and encephalocele. Now, all these things would probably will give me a clue towards, you know, a possible cause for ventricular megaly. The next thing is, see, when we talk about other things, even when you're you when we look at the ventricle, it is not just about the size. Looking at the ventricle itself in detail can give you so much of information to look, you know, and give us a clue towards a probable diagnosis. So you need to look at the shape, the, whether there are any septations, ecogenic contents, how is the periventricular space, how is the wall ecogenicity. Now let's see some of them. Now, if you have a shape of the ventricle, which is teardrop, then think of a genesis of purpose skeleton. If you find that the occipital horns are pointed, think of neural tube defects. Then if you have periventricular ecogenicity, you know, the, uh, the, the wall or the, there is a periventricular ecogenicity, or you are seeing intraventricular septations, think of infections. And then, yes, there are so many other factors that you have to look for. There are other so many clues which tell us about infections. You can have a periventricular uh, halo. You can have periventricular calcifications. You can have parenchymal calcifications like you see here. You, then there can be subependymal cysts. Uh, you know, there is another good pointer which could be an occipital horn cavity. You see, uh, you know, at the at, edge of the occipital horn, you see a cavity. You can have a head perimeter less than fifth centile, abnormal gyration, uh, uh, the corpus callosum hypoplasia and cerebellar hypoplasia. All these factors tell us these are the sonographic clues towards fetal infection. Then if you have an increased wall ecogenicity and the choroid plexus appears hit or the choroid plexus appears heterogeneous, think of hemorrhage. So primarily, if you're seeing something very, very dirty there, irregular, the wall is ecogenic, you see choroid plexus, but then you're not seeing the crisp wall, you're seeing something heterogeneous like this, you have to think of hemorrhage. If you have thickened and irregular walls, all if there is nodularity that you see, then think of neuronal migration disorders. Now here you can see, that, you know, if you have some this kind of nodules, irregularity, think of periventricular nodular heterotropia. And in the choroid plexus, if you see a very large choroid plexus cyst, or you see a mass in the choroid plexus or choroid plexus papilloma. So practically, I am only in the lateral ventricle. I have not gone beyond the lateral ventricle yet, but the lateral ventricle is giving me so much of information. Then. What are the important clues and on the axial scans, which one needs to evaluate in detail? You have to look for any absence or abnormal CSP, increased fluid in the posterior fossa, or you have an open fourth ventricle, the size and shape of the cerebellum is abnormal. Are there any abnormal findings on uh, in the cerebral parenchyma? Are there any absent or delayed or premature sulcations? and whether the, the subarachnoid space is increased or obliterated. Now look for the CSP. Okay, I'm getting into a different zone now. Now, if you have a CSP, which is absent, then first think of urgenesis of corpus callosum. Look for, like I said, your teardrop shape ventricle is a clue there. I need to I can see the three line sign, the CSP is absent. I need to go into my mid sag and coronal plane. In the coronal plane, I may see the frontal horns, which are uh, which have a shape like a Viking horn. But in the mid sag view, which, that is the one which is going to be truly diagnostic. And that is that you don't see the corpus callosum as, at all. Am I sure that this is a mid sag view? Yes, because I'm seeing the vermis. The worm is, is the uh, policeman when I'm looking for the corpus callosum. And when I'm looking for the worm is, the corpus callosum becomes my policeman. So I am in the mid side view, but I don't see the corpus callosum. I am not seeing the pericallosal artery. I know I am dealing with an uh, urgency of corpus callosum. If I find that the CSP is short and wide, 
or the CSP ratio is less than 1.5, then I have to think in terms of partial urgenesis of corpus callosum. And there you can see there is just a short part of the corpus callosum that is seen. And there is ventriculomegaly. And you can see that the, uh, the CSP is short and wide. Then, you know, the reason I'm talking about this is that callosal dysgenesis, urgenesis, partial urgenesis, or dysgenesis is the you know, one which has a very high association with ventriculomegaly. Now, in one of the studies, which was done in 2012, 13% of all cases of ventriculomegaly had callosal abnormalities. And out of that, 24% of these cases had isolated uh, callosal urgenesis, and the remaining had other CNS or chromosomal aberrations. If you have an absent CSP, with fused frontal horns. See, I'm actually taking you through an algorithmic approach. You have an absent CSP, you have fused frontal horns. Think of minor forms of holopresent kephaly, septo-optic dysplasia, isolated urgenesis of sept septo pellucidum, or season kephaly. You, you know, this is a typical appearance that you see that you have the frontal horns which are communicating, are fused, and then but of course, we, you know, you, uh, in, you can differentiate between uh, 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 a low bar holopresent kephaly and uh, uh, isolated urgenesis of septum pellucidum or SOD because in low bar holopresent kephaly, you will find that the uh, interhemispheric fissure in the frontal part is absent. The frontal lobes are fused. That does not happen here. The anterior aspect of the corpus callosum would be abnormal there. But in these cases of SOD and uh, isolated agenesis of SP, the corpus callosum is normal. So you can differentiate between these two. As far as holopresent kephaly, other forms is concerned, I don't think you you really need to. That is something which catches your eye and you can make a diagnosis there. Then look at the size of the cerebellum. Do you have a cerebellar hypoplasia? That is, so you, you that can be associated with ventriculomegaly or an abnormal shape. If you have a banana-shaped uh, cerebellum, then you uh, have to go ahead and look for and rule out Chiari 2 malformation in open spina bifida. If you have uh, 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 you know, a globular or triangular uh, the, uh, the shape of the cerebellum, you, that you have to think of Roman kephalosynapsis. I, I think there has been an overlap with the slides. I'll come to that later. But once there is an uh, you know, okay, I'll cover up Roman kephalosynapsis first. And so in that you have a, a cerebellum, which is uh, globular or triangular. The worm is, is absent or hypoplastic. The cerebellum loses, the, the cisterna magna loses its loss in shape. And you would find that the fourth ventricle index, which is, you know, the fourth ventricle normally has a larger transverse diameter and a shorter anterior posterior. But in if you find that the anterior posterior is longer and the, well, the fourth ventricular index is greater than one, then you have to think in terms of either uh, Roman kephalosynopsis or Jobert syndrome. And then you will find that the, uh, the foliae, the foliae are seen crossing the midline and these are all classical of Roman kephalosynopsis. But if you have an increased fluid space in the posterior fossa, you have to think in terms of Blake's pulse cyst, vermian hypoplasia, Dandy Walker malformation, and mega system of magna. I, I'm not going into the depth of this because we have a complete lecture on the posterior fossa later. I, and so subarachnoid space, increased cerebral atrophy. Uh, you know, if you, if you find that the cerebral uh, subarachnoid space is increased, you have to think of cerebral atrophy. If it is obliterated, you're thinking in terms of obstructive hydrocephalus. And look at the parenchyma. Are you seeing any clefts? Are you seeing any uh, cystic lesions like the poor encephalic cyst? Or you have clefts like in seasoned kephali? Are there any tumors or bleed? Or there are infection, you know, calcifications that you see in infections? And then you should know the complete spectrum of, you know, various sulci and gyri. What stage can you see? What is their, uh, you know, 
uh, how they look at what gestation. You should have a complete chart. Then only you will be able to say whether the there is a delayed sulcation or there is a premature sulcation, which suggests polymicrogyria. And in obstructive hydrocephalus, which you know you have an equiductal stenosis, the commonest cause, where you have a severe ventriculomegaly, a large head circumference, then you can have effacement of the sulci, and you will find the third ventricle, which is dilated, but the fourth ventricle looks normal and the choroid plexus would be seen dangling. What about unilateral ventriculomegaly? It's not very rare, but once you have it, you, have, you can think of partial agenesis of corpus callosum, infections, or maybe, but you, know, you have to treat it like this. Though the, there are studies now which say that, yes, the incidence of chromosome anomaly was 0% and congenital infection was 8%. And all these factors pointed out that, yes, this could be, you know, the neurodevelopment today was just what it could be in any other pregnancy. But we just can't uh, shirk it off and say just because it is a unilateral, we are not going to take care of that. As far as asymmetric, we say asymmetric ventricular megaly when there is a difference of two millimeter between the lateral ventricles. And you can, uh, you know, what is worse, uh, the symmetric are the ones which are associated with more with CNS abnormalities, but asymmetric could be worse because they could be associated with ischemic events or post-inflammatory could be the cause in this. Look for extracranial anomalies and soft markers of aneuploidy. You need to uh, do a complete detailed scan. And once you have done all these, you have ruled out soft markers, there's no other anomaly. You can say that this is an apparently isolated mild ventriculomegaly. I'm not calling it as mild ventricular megaly. I'm saying it's an apparently isolated mild ventricular megaly, or it's a sonographically isolated mild ventricular megaly. Now, this could still be associated with aneuploidy. We need to do further testings. Could be associated with fetal infections. Probably we could not see any signs there. It could be a, you know, a subtle indicator of certain cerebral lesions, which we could find later in gestation. We know that brain development and things keep taking place or then isolated ventricular megaly may be associated with other fetal abnormalities overall, which, uh, you know, which would probably get, uh, uh, you'll be able to see later on in pregnancy also. Overall risk of false negative diagnosis is 12.8%. Should an MRI be done for every fetus? It offers you marginal, it all depends upon a good ultrasoundologist, uh, you know, would require less amount of MRI. If you are doing wonderful transvaginal neurosonogram, you would uh, not require it much. But yes, in certain conditions, it's a problem-solving tool. When you have very poor sonographic penetration, you may require it. For subtle findings, you know, you may require an MRI. So, but then again, MRI is also based on in the third trimester. So it is not something that at 20 weeks, you are not able to pick up something on ultrasound and 20 weeks, you will pick up on MRI. It doesn't happen like that. So you need to be careful when you advise an MRI. And then we know ventriculomegaly as a, a likelihood ratio of 3.8 millimeter as an isolated finding. X-linked ventriculomegaly could be you know, over ventriculomegaly could be associated with X-link hydrocephaly. So we have a lot of genetic syndromes, which could also be there. Now, should prenatal testing be offered in isolated mild ventriculomegaly? Yes, large studies now have shown that, yes, it has an association, mainly with T21. 5% of the fetuses may have an abnormal karyotype, and another 10% may have other findings on chromosomal microarray. So, we, yes. But then we really don't know the two incidents because tests, uh, you know, these studies have been done in different populations, different protocols, but prenatal testing needs to be suggested. Uh, we forget on this and we need to screen for fetal infections. Maternal serology is the primary thing that we do. If you're finding some other findings, you can go ahead and do an amnio and PCR for CMV and toxo. Ventricle megaly has a natural history. In 34%, you can get regression. In 56%, it remains stable. And in 16%, it may progress. Now, if it regresses or remains stable, the risk of neurodevelopmental delay is less. But if it progresses, then the prognosis becomes poorer. And uh, how do we handle it? So I'm just coming to the close of it. You diagnose ventriculomegaly. 
you have an atrial width greater than 10 millimeter. Then grade it as mild, moderate, and severe. Do a detailed scan for cranial and extracranial anomalies. And then you, you say that this is apparently isolated and counsel the patient. Tell them about the need of a genetic consult. Tell them about the need or association with uh, uh, aneuploidies and uh, infections. MRI, you may, if you require. Then again, counsel them after all this has been done and then do serial evaluation to look for progression. And again, you need to counsel. So you're actually counseling at three times. And uh, we will quit. So I would end with some messages. Identifying ventriculomegaly is just the starting point, my dear friends. You know, ventriculomegaly should not come as a diagnosis in the impression. Your diagnosis is going to be something else. A detailed scan to rule out intracranial and extracranial anomalies. We know it can be associated with so many other things. Parents should be informed about the possibility of progression and associated anomalies. 7 to 10% of fetuses with isolated ventriculomegaly are found to have other structural abnormalities on examination after birth. We need to keep this in mind and in a very, very subtle way inform this also. But remember one thing that isolated mild ventriculomegaly, which is not progressive, is likely to have an excellent prognosis and a good outcome with normal developmental milestones. So ventriculomegaly is just a finding, not a diagnosis. Isolated ventriculomegaly is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have got to exclude things one, 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 and then you say this is isolated. Hence, you need to do the best possible and make sure that it is isolated before you tell the patient. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bimal Sahani, for a very authoritative and passionate presentation. It's a great responsibility of fetal medicine specialist to objectively assess the abnormality and differentiate it from the normal variant. Once it is diagnosed as abnormality, then the grading of severity of ventriculomegaly and identifying other associated abnormalities as another task. Obstetricians are happy that fetal medicine has emerged as a uh, great specialty and uh, we obstetricians appreciate that uh, the, because our responsibility is shared and shifted to fetal medicine specialists. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Uh, organizers will uh, ask questions from the chat box or uh, somebody will... Uh... Mm. The audience interaction is at the end of the program today. End of the program, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's slated for 9.15 9, onwards, yes. Okay. Thank you. Can someone introduce Ashok so that uh, he will start his lecture? Uh, ma'am, Dr. Sajana, ma'am, uh, may I request you to please uh, introduce Dr. Ashok Kurana, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, good, once again, good evening to you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gayatri, for your nice interaction. At the outside, I would like to thank Dr. Sridevi and her team for making me a part of the Society of Fetal Medicine inaugural session. And I'm glad to co-chair along with my senior colleagues, Dr. Subaraj Garu and Dr. Raghana. And uh, I feel proud, privileged to come out with the curriculum vitae of Professor Dr. Ashok Kurana. I really feel preterm and premature to speak about him. But anyhow, he graduated his MBBS and also MD in radio diagnosis from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He trained in ultrasound at the Harlow Hospital in Denmark, a chairman and consultant in reproductive ultrasound at the ultrasound lab, New Delhi, practicing ultrasound since 1980 in New Delhi. Held so many posts, Professor School of Health Sciences International University, Croatia, Professor Indian Medical Association from 2017 to 2020, past president of Society of Fetal Medicine from 2018 to 2020. He's a former ambassador in India for International Society of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. He's the editor-in-chief uh, editor for the Journal of Fetal Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ashok, uh, Ashok Kurana, may I request you for your talk on Technical advances in fetal medicine, fetal CNS evaluation. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure to be here in the uh, maiden program of the uh, Andhra chapter of the Society of Fetal Medicine. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to present this topic. It's uh, something that is completely new. And I'm, uh, of course, uh, I, I would love it if, if all the local people were presenting, but I think to get things going, it's a good idea to get some of us from the center but I'm really looking forward to a lot of uh, local activity. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And my congratulations to Dr. Sridevi for putting together such a great team. Uh, we start off with my presentation in the next 20 minutes. I will talk about uh, technical advances in evaluation of the fetal central nervous system because there have been tremendous advances and we need to understand these. We've had uh, advances in the field of uh, um, 2D ultrasound, we've had advances in the field of 3D ultrasound, advances in visualization in early pregnancy. We've had the increasing role of smartphones in our uh, daily system professionally, both for work as well as for knowledge. And so I will take you this because technology really has come a long way in the last uh, decade or so. We've had uh, it as such a game changer in fetal diagnosis and prognosis. And this talk provides a window into this uh, very exciting and useful space. And I hope to take you through it tonight briefly, but uh, nevertheless, uh, to let you know how much things have changed from a good 2D ultrasound scan showing us fantastic uh, uh, intravaginal uh, anatomy, uh, the lateral ventricles, the aqueductus sylvius, a tomographic ultrasound slice showing you every single slice from the back to the front, and then of course onto MR, where we're now able to pick up connections as well. So I'll take you through transducer technology, the role of 3D and 4D, how we handle um, cases right from seven weeks onwards and especially the 10 to 14 weeks window. And most importantly, guiding the geneticist with a detailed phenotype. We know that the phenotype today has to guide the genotype. There's just too much in genetics today that we'll say, okay, we will do this test and get the answers. No, we have an array of tests starting from a QFPCR to a karyotype to a, a, a microarray to a genome sequencing, exome sequencing and so on, or just a group of genes. And the more we give on a phenotype, the more we get out of a genotype and technology is helping us to do that. We also have guidelines. We have new guidelines, which I will introduce you to. Uh, artificial intelligence, which is now here to stay. A slide or two on MRI, because uh, there's not been really that much anything new. It's now just a uh, technology that is here to stay. And of course, knowledge, because um, knowledge has changed. And that is part of technology. We now get access to this knowledge uh, because of our access to the internet. So let me start right at the beginning without wasting further time. The first big jump that has really come about is the routine use of tissue harmonic imaging. And you can see the difference in the edges that you see in this image here, and the edges that you see, say, in the far side of the cerebellum here. You can actually see the edge very clearly. And this business of getting much clearer clear images is something uh, that was the first big step towards technology in routine ultrasound imaging. Harmonic imaging is now just a touch of a button, and there is a no big deal thing to it. The other good thing, of course, is the maturing of the balance uh, between transabdominal and transvaginal scans. We get excellent views uh, today with high frequency transabdominal transducers. And a lot of the times uh, uh, the transvaginal scan may not even be required. Also, it is difficult to manipulate. So if you have something like a high frequency single matrix firing transducer like the C2-9, like I've shown here, you can actually do almost all your work transabdominally. However, if you do not get as much anatomy as you want, or in case there is a clinical pointer, an ultrasound pointer, or it's a second opinion study, I would still suggest we go ahead and still use the transvaginal uh, uh, studies to make sure we identify as clearly as possible. You, you can see how nicely you can see every bit of the fetus, even with the transabdominal scan. This advantage of technology is that in 3D as well, of course, there's been uh, an array of transducers. We have two sets of uh, transvaginal transducers, a lower frequency and a higher frequency. We have non-3D transabdominal transducers, standard 3D transducers, and of course, the matrix transducer. 
And so we've really moved on and reproduced for ourselves in real life what Leonardo da Vinci actually thought of as a uh, fetus in utero. We realize now, of course, that this kind of an image is too advanced a fetus. What we do, when we do see this image, it's usually in a 12 week fetus sitting inside there. And you can see the details that you can pick up, including uh, cystic hygroma sitting here at the back of the neck. You can then go on to actually use newer 3D technology whenever you see anything abnormal to realize that this is not really a cystic hygroma, that this is a gap in the bone, a wide gap in the bone, a soft tissue gap, and that the usual anatomy of the posterior cranial fossa that I would have anticipated at 12 plus weeks is lost. I don't see a, um, a cavity of the rhomban kephalon. I see instead something here like this. And when I work on this a little harder, I get more outlines. This is called the silhouette mode. I'm able to identify that, yes, there is much more wrong with the entire ventricular system. And when I go into the details of this case, I realize that, yes, a transvaginal scan shows a bump on top of the head here and a bump coming at the back. And importantly, I'm demonstrating a molar tooth at the time of the 12 weeks and four days scan, which means that this is Joubert syndrome. The evaluation of the syndrome, which now you can in retrospect see with the transabdominal view as well, because now you know what it looks like, tells me that yes, I start suspecting transabdominally, move on to this kind of technology, start suspecting the, that there is too much of uh, fluid in the ventricular system, move on to high technology, use the silhouette mode and get your answer that yes, this is what the geneticist should do. So this is where we stand in technology today and it's not expensive. The advantage of technology is pretty much the same as in smartphones, which means that in order to see what you want to see, you may not necessarily need to buy today's technology today. You could buy it after six months or eight months when it becomes much cheaper, and then you can do all these studies just the way you would have wanted to do them otherwise. And this has a huge amount of function, particularly um, when we want to scratch below the surface, not just surface rendering from 3D in, and real-time 3D, but actually ventricular system and other things in here. And look at this <clears throat> nine week embryo, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where you actually see normal anatomy and see how beautifully a normal rhomban kephalon would have really looked like. And of course you can uh, shift over to a bone mode rather than a surface mode and pick up as much bone as you wish. There is an area of these transducers, like I mentioned, there is uh, the older ones, which are transabdominal, but with a lot of new software. And then there is the third generation matrix transducer, where the surface anatomy is even very fascinating. Plus, you can actually do all of this work in a much shorter period of time, and yet it remains completely safe and not of increased exposure to the fetus. I mentioned that there were two frequencies for the transvaginal transducer and the six to 12 megahertz is particularly good for early pregnancy. There is also now this fascinating RM7C transducer, which again is one of those fascinating, fascinating pieces of technology where you can see marvelous things like the entire circle within the brain, the corpus callosum, as well as the bone in the same frame. And this is technology that is really technology of the future where a single transducer can look after everything that you want to do and the cost of this transducer is coming down every month. We've also realized that you can go beyond the conventional way of looking at a fetus transabdominally to transvaginally. And the way we've been doing this so far is by doing a sagittal plane or by doing a coronal plane. As you see here, you would be able to very well go through the fontanelle and see a beautiful uh, 2D uh, corpus callosum or a coronal view of the middle of the brain. What we also have realized that in our direct application of 2D and 3D, we can actually view the brain from the back. A direct view because the vaginal transducer is placed like so, as you see here on my slide, and then you can identify uh, with either a 2D or 3D reconstruction, the highest structure, which is the aqueduct of uh, Sylvius, the uh, fourth ventricle behind it, the entire middle of pons and brain sitting right there. And of course, the Blake spout sitting here right behind the medulla and communicating with the cisterna magna. In fact, you will realize that these little micrographs, electronic micrographs of pathological specimens is actually not even as clear as the, M, as the ultrasound image. And this ultrasound image 
<coughs> excuse me, is as good as a um, as an MRI image, and you can manipulate it in real time and see what it's offering you. It's because of this kind of technology that we now realize that you can actually follow these new things that have come up in the neurosonogram, both by just single frame analysis or by orthogonal planes or by multi-slice planes. And all of this is now available by a single touch on touch screens available on neural machines. There used to be people grumbling and rumbling saying that, look, the corpus callosum appears just echogenic and you can't make out the real structure on 3D reconstruction. And we've overcome that with new technology. You can actually now make out that the corpus callosum is a hypoechoic structure and you can see it on 3D reconstructions. And you can see it even better if you set the, uh, the settings to sepia depending on the status of your eye. And everywhere you can see it as a hypoechoic structure that is um, sandwiched between two echogenic layers which represent the PL reflections. So that is no longer true that you just get a rumble of anatomy, you get a clear representation of anatomy. Because with 3D, you can represent not just one single plane, but orthogonal planes and navigate through those. Multi-slice like I've shown you, you can slice through anywhere uh, in, in the uh, volume that you have acquired, and that's called OmniView. You can do volume calculations using vocal. You can acquire color and grayscale together and reconstruct those. And of course, you can do a 3D rendering to better demonstrate anatomy, which clinicians would better understand, neurosurgeons would better understand, and the patient would better appreciate. So this has been the great advantage of technology at a very basic level. What we've also succeeded in doing is to realize that now we can look at vascularity also with great fascination, and that in a mid-sagittal view, we can see this junction of the superior sagittal sinus very clearly with the straight sinus, and that this junction represents the torcular herophili. Our biggest problem so far in differentiating between verminogenesis and Dandy Walker malformations was the inability on ultrasound to identify the exact location of the torcular herophili. And this can now be done um, both in, uh, in 2D as well as in 3D, and 2D is equally good with this as long as you get a good vaginal view. How do we use this information? It's from this marvelous article by Paolo Volpe, which appeared just a couple of years ago, where the group has clearly shown that in the normal fetus, there is a wide U representing the superior sagittal sinus on one side and the straight sinus on the other side. In the fetus with an open neural tube defect, you find that the U becomes a tight V, and that then is the marker for open spina bifida a nice simple way of actually figuring this out. And um, so uh, if you were to try and differentiate a normal and open neural tube defect, and if you find that you find a cystic appearance sitting abnormally in the, in the posterior cranial fossa here at 12 weeks, you will find a displacement of that entire torcular structure like that. And you know, okay, if my whole brain has moved away from the torcular, then I know this is a Nandy Walker malformation. So you have like a confirmed diagnosis, able to counsel your patient, follow them up early at 16 weeks to confirm this or get your genetics going, and then you get the answer correctly. The other thing that we have learned to do, and this is uh, a case from Dr. Mohit Shah that uh, I co-authored, and uh, we were able to get it to the cover of the White Journal, the Journal of the, Indian, the International Society for Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology to show that the difference here in technology is to demonstrate that this mass here is not a standard vein of gallon aneurysm sitting at the back of the supratentorial compartment, but something that has vessels coming in the back and displacing the rest of the brain anteriorly, which automatically then made it a dural sinus malformation and not a vein of gallon aneurysm. Not that this has any better a prognosis, but at least we knew that this is what we were looking at. We could counsel our patient correctly and we could get a correct diagnosis uh, because of the fascination of being able to combine grayscale information with color information in what is now called uh, glass body imaging. We also have a great assistance in saving time when we do scans. And that's extremely important in busy practices. And, you know that in India, we are always burdened with numbers. 
we now have touch screens with straightforward images like this that show you the transducer, show you the various presets, and you can choose one at the touch of a button and become more and more familiar. So for each transducer, you actually have a preset. Remember that there is automation that has also come along and uh, the Omni view I was telling you about where you can slice anyway. All you do is to acquire a BPD plane, press one button called Sono CNS, and automatically the machine then builds the BPD plane. It builds for you the transventricular plane. And uh, have you lost me there? Or can you see me now? Are you able to see me and see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Prigin. And so, yes, Jack. thank you. So you're able to rebuild the trans, uh, uh, the, the BPD plane, the transventricular plane, as well as uh, the uh, transcerebellar plane instantly by just pressing a button. In fact, there is this realization that with the moving of artificial intelligence, we've been able to let the machine actually identify an area for you and say, yes, that this is the face and you're looking for it in an abnormal CNS condition. And it tick marks off for you your checklist. You could either have a basic checklist or a, um, an advanced checklist. And all of this, the machine ticks mar tick marks for you because it is already programmed by artificial intelligence to handle this. And this has been on the market for two years already. In fact, all the 20 planes suggested by uh, Iswag for uh, the uh, entire examination in the second trimester have now been included. And as you can see here, it includes a transventricular plane, a transthalamic plane, a transcerebellar plane, a profile sagittal plane, the orbits, and a nose lip view with, and a sagittal spine. And you can imagine how much that single checklist will tell you that, yes, this is it. And it will identify that you're in the right plane. Not only these are guidelines, we've moved beyond that. And we have now data that we've sent off to various agencies in the world. And this is work that is going on in Gurgaon in India, where abnormalities are then identified by uh, artificial intelligence because the machine has learned to identify these. There's also been a work, a bunch of work from China, as you see in this uh, printed paper already from 2020, which came from China. And of course, like I said, we have some of this work going on in association with, with Oxford University, uh, with work going on in our Gurgaon facility. Remember that the same equipment that you use is also now being used as a method of teaching you. So as you scan, it actually identifies what you're doing. It identifies what you need to achieve in terms of a reference image, what you are getting and what you should be working on. And it actually tells you that, yes, this is the area. This is the way you should be going in. This is your uh, scan plane. And this is what you set out to achieve. All of this guides you to get the right scan plane without having to train differently. And you can imagine what that has meant in COVID times. COVID times have actually accelerated this and I'm quite happy that they have. Um, also, importantly speaking, we do realize that teaching is becoming more and more difficult. It's difficult to get away from practices. And in a country like India, this would be extremely useful that we can actually coach ourselves into making sure that we learn um, on site with a minimum amount of supervision. Supervision can always happen, but it's not always available. And therefore this is an excellent alternative as a part of the education, ongoing education. I would also like to point out that these guidelines are now uh, fairly uh, well known. Um, we have the neurosonogram from ISWOG, which tells us not only about the three standard axial planes, but coronal planes from front to back as well as uh, sagittal and parasagittal planes. Very similar to the neurosonogram at the second trimester or later, we also have uh, an excellent amount of information coming in telling us that, look, it's not that you have to do these in real time. That same omniview I was talking about, use these slices from front to back and you can get this information on one single frozen image of the mid of the brain as long as it contains a volume. There is also a, a first trimester guideline which has become available from uh, the group of uh, uh, Nicola Volpe and the Enso group, which tells us that we now have a clean, good um, demonstration of what we need to do at the 12 week window. 
we have two axial planes, which you and me are now familiar with, the, what we call the ventricular plane, but it's actually the suprathalamic plane. And the other one is the view through the aqueduct of Sylvius, which we call the transthalamic view. There is the mid-sagittal anteplane, of course, where you get to see the entire midbrain, the intracranial translucency, and the cisterna magna right ahead in the same image that we use to look at the nuchal translucency, the palate, as well as the nasal bone. I've already discussed the posterior approach, and that is the other standard approach. And then these are coronal scans. And I will show you in a few minutes how easy these are to obtain with the new technology. We've also learned to look at ventricular megaline in the first trimester. And again, uh, uh, this is a way of calculating uh, either the length or the area, and you get your answer. And I've already discussed with you how easy it is now to identify the torcula by the junction between the superior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus. These are the uh, coronal planes that are suggested in the first trimester, and you wonder, how am I ever going to achieve this? It's not truly difficult at all. Uh, we start with our standard uh, looking, as we do for the aqueductus sylvius, and you already know by our knowledge what is anterior, what is posterior. And again, here you realize that better than the line diagram, better than the, uh, the, the electron micrograph of the pathological specimen, you can actually see this plane very nicely. But more important than these standard planes, we realize that a single sweep with a 3D transvaginal transducer and realigning the orthogonal planes in the coronal plane will give you each one of these planes from front to back, starting with the orbits and all the way back to the posterior cranial fossa, showing up exactly the way you'd like it to show up. So it's not that this is something hitting out into the air. This is something that is here to stay, easy to interpret. And you can see that this is a 13 week one, 13 week four day fetus uh, showing us exactly what we would like to see. Of course, the usual stuff we are now um, uh, showing off uh, routinely without too much of an effort. The fact that if I don't see a butterfly, I demonstrate holoprosin carefully and an abnormal face. And all of this is uh, made possible by uh, uh, transvaginal 3D reconstruction at uh, 13 weeks. And you can use the same thing for demonstrating semi-loba holoprosin carefully to convince the patients about anencephaly in case they're not convinced by the usual kind of scans. And also to convince them better by the use of new technology because patients would think that this is a head that will grow. When you show them this and say that, no, it's flattened and the face looks grotesque, they're more likely to accept this diagnosis and decide. In fact, because of this kind of technology, we are now being able to describe different types of acranias and anencephaly, all of which have a different genetic basis. And this work is from Simon Ma's group. We know we've been looking at the nuchal translucency for some years now, and there's lots of signs described in the first trimester. But importantly, we've realized that there are some additional signs that have appeared in the last few years. One of these was that the parallel cerebral peduncles uh, will tell us that yes, this is normal, and that this parallel thick peduncle will tell us there's an open neural tube defect, and then you start looking for it. It's been called the crash sign, which is actually Simon Ma's sign, which has been hijacked by Fred Ushako, but we will excuse him for that. But it does explain exactly the same thing. But more importantly, we have realized that in our conventional nipple translucency plane, we're getting more use of the posterior cranial fossa. And uh, we use the same measurement that we would have used otherwise, but we start looking for absence or enlargement. And that will identify not just an open neural tube defect, and kephalosis, but also the dandy walker malformation. And um, because of the fact that the brainstem gets displaced, or the fact that you actually see something sitting in the fossa, we're now able to go beyond just diagnosing open neural tube defects. And so when we see an absent uh, um, uh, intracranial translucency and a thickened brainstem, of course, you start looking down the spine. That is the easy part of it. But the other equally important part is when you see a cystic mass here, you know that, aha, this could be Dandy Walker. I would then go on to do a vascular study and I will confirm my diagnosis as early as 12 to 13 weeks. A few more minutes before I close to, uh, to show you that we have also a couple of newer signs. And one of these again was from Simon Ma's group, which says that you draw what is called the maxillo-occipital line. This line is drawn from the top of the palate and goes straight back. And then you try and compare the location of the brainstem compared to this 
a line. In normal fetuses at about 13 weeks, the junction between the midbrain and the brainstem is above this line, uh, which is this portion here. And in fetuses that have an open spina bifida, that junction slips to below this line. A simple, straightforward thing for which you even don't even need to draw a line. You just have to have the knowledge, the right view, and you say, okay, even uh, subjectively, a line here is way above the junction between the midbrain and the brainstem. We also learned, like I said, to identify the so-called uh, ventricular megaly. We know that measurements can be quite tricky, and we have realized that length seems to be the easiest one to use uh, compared to area or volumes. And again, this is work uh, that has been around a few years and we've revived it in recent years. We've also started looking again at agenesis of the corpus callosum. Yes, it's a structure that's not there at this time, but this work, which was reported by uh, Robert Lachman several years ago, tells us that if you don't reduce the gains in your NT image, you can actually measure the midbrain diameter and compare it with the height of the fox and realize that in agenesis of the corpus callosum, the midbrain diameter is more and the fox is less tall. And therefore, this could be a clue to an agenesis of the corpus callosum at 12 weeks. Again, simple knowledge, not high end in technology, but something that can tell you. And so I believe that this is quite a leap in telling us what is going on. We've also moved on to the window between seven and 11 weeks. And we realize that new technology gives us an excellent idea of the surface and below the surface, the change in the ventricular system from seven weeks uh, to nine weeks and that we can use this all the time. And we've actually gone several steps ahead and said, okay, you can identify most of the holoprosome cephalies, encephalocelles, exencephalies, conjoined twins, and so on, acranias, even as early as eight to nine weeks. This is work we presented at ISWOG last year. We've also learned that there's normal variance at this time. For instance, a globular cavity of the hindbrain is not abnormal and is a normal variation, and that the aqueduct of Sylvius at 10 weeks is far more posterior placed than it is at 12 weeks. So that's the sort of work uh, that we're now able to do. Of course, people ask, what's the hurry? There is a hurry. Early termination of pregnancy is easier, safer, early reassurance to at-risk mothers, and a much longer window for genetics. Remember also that in these cases, the different case above, different below, reconstruction gives you additional information, which is far more convincing for the clinician. A word on MRI before we close. Um, we now using three uh, Tesla and more, all of which are regarded as safe, but it remains a problem solving modality and far better after 26 weeks than before. For those of you who need more information on this, we have our Society of Fetal Medicine series uh, of, um, on MRI uh, on the third Monday of every month and it's, a, it's free for all. And you can actually overcome this so that our lack of knowledge or the, or the accusation that lack of interest by radiologists is not letting this go forward will no longer hold true. Yes, there is a downside of expertise, cost of equipment, but this is not something we can't overcome. The more effort we make, the easier it is. Yes, there is the embryological timetable. Some things will not be there. And of course, the fact that some mothers who will turn out to be normal will actually be anxious because of some borderline finding. These are things that will happen in science and we have to learn to accept. But I'd like to close with implications for daily practice. With this talk, I wish to emphasize that practicing obstetricians should be aware of what is available and utilize this technological progress. The greater the use, the less of the cost. And we've seen this happen with things like NIPT and genetics in India. Imaging specialists should rapidly adopt state-of-art technology to facilitate diagnosis and prognosis. And geneticists should demand a detailed phenotype to facilitate optimal testing. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Kurana, sir, that was an excellent talk. You made it very simple and practical with your pictorial representation. And uh, starting off with uh, tissue harmonic imaging and also the role of high frequency transabdominal, uh, transvaginal probes also in certain situations, transabdominal probes, moving to glass body imaging for concrete diagnosis. Uh, we assure you definitely we try to utilize the technical advances, 
and I, do, I joined Dr. Radha in saying that you are really a boost for the obstet practicing obstetricians. Thank you, Ansitin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before you, we go on to the next part of the program, we have a, a, a trade partner videos for. Back. Welcome back. I now request uh, Dr. K. Subbaraji sir to please welcome our uh, next speaker for the evening. Uh, Dr. T. L. N. Praveen sir, who will be talking to us about facts and myths about cerebellar burmis and cystina magna. Dr. Subbaraji sir. Sir, Miru, unmute chair. Unmuted. Ah, right, you are, you are audible now. CV slide. Uh, Subra, you are, I think, uh, the introduction also within. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, please wait, sir. Gayatri, please uh, share the slide, Ma. I know as sir told, he doesn't need introduction, especially in the state of Andhra Pradesh, but still he is... Uh, sir, I, I, sir is I, I, our mentor Sri for Devi. the Andhra Pradesh uh, chapter. And he is a guide for all of us here. Congratulate you, Sri Devi, for uh, starting a chapter of uh, Society of Fatal Medicine. And also, I thank you for uh, making me the part of this inaugural CME, addressed by the stalwarts like Ashok Purana and Praveen and Bimal Sahani. And I, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Ellen Praveen. He is a professor of radiology, director of Sheikh Institute on Images. He is practicing fatal medicine for the past 35 years. Passing, uh, his passion is looking at the fetus and performing invasive procedures. He is a teacher and training postdoctoral students, running and hiking other hobbies. And he had many awards for his credit. Certificate of Excellence for uh, first coronary angioplasty in the country. Appreciation Award from Foxy. Dr. Ashok Mukherjee Gold Medal for Original Innovative Interventional Procedures. Indira Pridarsini Award for the year 2014 for scientific contribution in medicine. Lifetime Achievement Award 2018 by Tamil Nadu State IREA. He has published a chapter in the test book of radiology and he has several publications. I also thank him for contributing a chapter myself, Dr. Radha and Dr. Asuda. With this brief introduction, I welcome you, Dr. Praveen, to deliver your lecture and facts and myths about cerebellar vermis and cystina magna. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, one thing. This will stop for the screen sharing. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, can I share? Uh, yeah, I'll share my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the, those kind words. And uh, I congratulate uh, uh, SFM AP team for organizing this webinar on uh, CNS, their first webinar. And I'm sure it's really heartwarming because uh, we know that there are so many people whom we know and we have been practicing fetal medicine uh, throughout the state. And now it's an opportunity for all of us to showcase your, uh, your abilities, your, your cases, so that uh, it gets uh, uh, national recognition. Now, with these few words, I would like to thank the center, Dr. Ashok Purana and Vimal Sahani, 
for uh, giving uh, this opportunity for the APSFM state to organize this webinar. Today, I will be talking to you about uh, the myths of vermis. Now, when we talk about the vermis, actually the vermian abnormalities are uh, quite rare. But unfortunately, the development of vermis extends over a long period. And thus, it makes it vulnerable to various malformations and disruptions. Uh, and ultrasound is the most important imaging modality, which is used in screening and evaluating various posterior fossa tumor lesions, and the, particularly the vermis. Now, uh, ultrasound can be used in evaluating posterior fossa transabdominally or transvaginally. And there are basically three most important things that we need to understand is the basic axial plane, that is the transcerebellar plane, which is basically used to evaluate the posterior fossa. Wherever there is a problem where we may not be able to really evaluate the vermis, then we usually do uh, by using what is called as the 3D volume rendering, uh, using a multiplanar as well as omniview. It can be done both transabdominally or as well as transvaginally. And then the, uh, the advanced neurosonography, which quite often is done transvaginally, but sometimes even transabdominally, where we try to evaluate uh, the fetal brain, particularly the posterior fossa, in the coronal sections as well as the mid sagittal sections. Now, fetal MRI is uh, coming up in a great way, particularly in the posterior fossa lesions, um, particularly when we start using fast as ultra fast MRI sequences, which provide higher tissue contrast as well as spatial resolution. Now, I would like to just take you through these images where we can see the vermis at different stages or different gestational age. This is the 10th week of uh, the embryo where we can see the plica choroidae. And at 12th week also still we do find the plica choroidae, above which uh, is the, uh, the area of area membranous, uh, membranous and then the uh, anterior area membranous and the posterior area membranous. And the anterior area membranous is the one which develops into the vermis. You can see the worm is right from 14th week. If when you do a transvaginal, sagittal section of the posterior fossa. And at 16th week, you can still further develop, see the vermis in much more clarity. And by 20th week, you almost get the whole of the vermis, both morphologically and biometry also. This is the MR sections of the fetal brain, particularly showing the midbrain as well as the hindbrain. So this is the information that one can obtain by doing a proper transversal examination of the posterior fossa. Now, overview on the key facts which we are going to deal with are the knowledge of the posterior fossa development. One need to understand the normal imaging patterns, that is the morphology as well as the measurements at different stages of embryogenesis. A large spectrum of posterior fossa abnormalities um, uh, which are going to be dealt with and their clinical implications, use of ultrasound and MRI in, uh, the, in evaluating these, these posterior fossa lesions. And the posterior fossa structures are basically assessed by taking a basic transvaginal, tran transaxial cerebellar plane, as well as the coronal and the mid sagittal sections. Now, how do we approach it? Whenever we try to do the coronal section, basically a transvaginal evaluation is very ideal because you have a good window. There are two windows which will be of great help in evaluating the posterior fossa. One is the anterior fontanelle. Even though the most often the anterior fontanelle is used to evaluate the anterior complex, whereas uh, this can be tilted posteriorly so that you get this sort of a coronal section of the fetal brain where you can see the owl's view appearance, where you can see the, uh, the occipital horns of the uh, uh, lateral ventricles, cerebellar hemispheres. You can see the cerebellar hemispheres on either side, which are dumbbell shaped or figure of eight shaped and then the echogenic vermis is very, very clearly seen. Whereas once you use the, the posterior fontanelle, this is the anatomy that you can demonstrate. Now, when we are doing the transvaginal examination, it is usually a bimanual examination. With your left hand, we try to manipulate the fetal head in such a way that the transducer head is used to focus through the, the, uh, the uh, window, the acoustic window, which is the anterior fontanelle posterior fontanelle. And in this one, you can beautifully see the, the brain stem, that is the mid, um, midbrain and the hindbrain abdominal, uh, hindbrain anatomy, where you can see the tectum, you can see the aqueduct, vermis, vestigium, pons, and medulla oblongata. So this is the clarity with which you can evaluate the 
posterior fossa by using the, the posterior fontanel as a window. Now, the other approach is the axial and the mid sagittal sutures, the anterior and the mid sagittal sutures, which can be used to basically to, uh, to evaluate the diencephalon, mesencephalon junction, but it is, can also be used to, to evaluate the tectum and the quadrigeminal system, as well as the vermis to some extent. The posterior fossa, particularly the midbrain, is beautifully demonstrated when the fetus is in prone position by using what is called as the innominate suture as the window. These are the four approaches that one can take into consideration while evaluating the fetal brain, particularly the posterior fossa. Now with this, these are the three classical ultrasound and MRI planes that we are going to use in evaluating the posterior fossa, particularly for the vermis. As you can see this, this is the classical transaxial plane of the transcerebellar uh, axial plane, where you can see the cerebellar hemispheres, you can see the rectangular or square shaped echogenic structure that is the vermis and a small slit like structure, which is lateral to lateral diameter is more than the AP diameter, and you can see the system of Macana. Whereas this is the coronal section where you can see, as I already described, the cerebellar hemispheres and the vermis. And here in the, in the sagittal section, you can see the vermis. The same corresponding sections on MRI examination. Now, not only that, whenever there is a problem in evaluating these structures, we can always uh, 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 fall upon the, uh, uh, the 3D volume rendering where you can acquire the volume in the sagittal plane or in the coronal plane or in the axial plane and they try to render the other two orthogonal planes to be namely the sagittal as well as the coronal where you can see the tectum as well as the brain stem and the worm is very clearly. You can enhance the image by using volume contrast imaging. Not only that, you can use what is called as the TUI that is the, the tomogram, sorry, the tomographic ultrasound imaging, where you can take multiple sections, which gives us information. Now coming to e, each of the structures, which I have already demonstrated or de described in the previous slides, these are the things that we are going to look for as far as the sagittal coronal, as well as the actual planes are concerned. And there are six questions which we have to answer whenever we are trying to evaluate the posterior fossa. The most important thing is that the first and foremost thing is that the posterior fossa fluid spaces are the normal, enlarged or reduced, that is one. Two is uh, the tentorium normally inserted or oriented, cerebellar biometry normal, cerebellar and brainstem morphology, is it normal or abnormal? Then we have the fourth ventricle, whether its shape is normal, location of the fourth ventricle, parietal plexus, are the other factors which will help us in diagnosing posterior fossa lesions, particularly the vermian abnormalities, and then the vermian morphology, biometry, as well as the location. So these are the factors, these are the questions that we need to answer in order to come to a diagnosis. And the answer will always lead us to the diagnosis of the posterior fossa lesions, particularly of the vermis. That's how you break the myth. Now, coming to the posterior fossa fluid spaces, enlarged and decreased. Whenever there is an enlarged posterior fossa, one need to think in terms of possible megacystina magna or a posterior fossa cyst, and then the fourth ventricle abnormalities. This fourth ventricle abnormalities can be distorted fourth ventricle, elongated fourth ventricle, or a large fourth ventricle, which corresponds to a chromosomal abnormality or a posterior fossa cyst. Then comes the decreased one, wherever there is obliteration of cystina magna, basically because of Arnaud Chari malformation, which is uh, quite often seen in uh, open neural tube defects of the occipital encephalo seals. Now, this is the classical example, and this is how you are going to measure the cisterna magna. The depth of the cisterna magna is always not more than 10 millimeters. Whenever it is more than 10 millimeters, we consider it to be a mega cisterna magna, which as a whole, as, as such, has no clinical relevance because it does not indicate anything except that when this is associated with other features like vermian abnormalities or cerebellar abnormalities, we do give importance to this increased depth of cisterna magna. Then comes what is called as the obliterated cisterna magna. As you can see here, this is what is called as the banana sign. As you can see, you can fit the banana right into the cerebellar hemispheres, which is because of the traction from the card, because of the open neural tube defect, the, this, this Arnold Cherry malformation, the whole of the posterior fossa is pulled back, it herniates into the uh, foramen magnum, and that results in what is called as the distortion of the cerebellar hemispheres, which are normally dumbbell-shaped or the figure of eight shape, they become banana-shaped. Then comes the, the, the insertion and orientation of tentorium. 
this slide actually has been shown by Dr. Ashok also. This has been published in 2021 wide journal by Rabi and et al, where they have basically took two factors into consideration. One is the straight sinus, the second one is the superior sagittal sinus. Not only that this U is important, but also that we need to draw a line along what is called as the tentorium, um, brainstem tentorium angle. This is the brainstem. You know, this is the sagittal section which we all take for the nuchal transducency, where you can beautifully demonstrate the brainstem. And then you have the tentorium which has been demonstrated because normal tentorium cannot be seen. Uh, and when, unless you put the, the color where you can see the torcura herophily, which has been formed by the superior sagittal sinus and the superior sinus. And this is the angle which gets obliterated. Normally it is acute, whereas when it becomes more than obtuse, that is more than 90, one need to think in terms of an open neural tube defect. And not only that, this U is again an important one, a wide open view and a, a, and a closed clamp view. So these are the things that will help us in identifying various posterior postural abnormality based on the tentorium. Not only that, we all know that the tentorium will be elevated whenever there is a posterior for cystic space of wearing lesion in the form of a dandiva of malformation. Now, next comes, the, this is the angles that have been described. Now, coming to the cerebellar biometry as well as the morphology, particularly when dealing with the posterior fossa, because there is a lot of alterations that takes place as far as cerebellar biometry and morphology is concerned in most of the vermian abnormalities. In, in the normally developing fetus, the TCD, that is the transcerebellar distance, increases with gestational age. Whereas whenever there is an increase in the ratio between the TCD and the AC, it indicates that there is a fetal growth restriction. There are three main pathological settings that we have to keep in mind while dealing with cerebellar abnormalities. One is what is called as the retrocerebellar fluid collection with normal or abnormal cerebellar biometry which is common, quite often seen in dandivacum malformation, Blake's fault cyst, vermian agenesis, and arachnoid cyst. Whereas there can be a partial or globally decreased cerebellar biometry, which could be because of cerebellar hyperplasia, agenesis, rhombin cephalosynopsis, ischemic or hemorrhagic damages, partially or globally altered cerebellar echogenicity, that is, they become echogenic, particularly when there is ischemic and hemorrhagic damage that has taken place or capillary telangiectasia. So this is the nomograms of the TCD which at, at various gestational age, which you can make use of in evaluating the, the transverse diameter of the, uh, the cerebellum. Now, a, a, few, a, a simple word about the morphometry of the brainstem, because the brainstem can be very nicely demonstrated. And not only that, even though we are dealing basically today on vermis, it is also essential that we need to understand the morphometry of the brainstem. This is the midbrain. That is the aqueduct of stenosis. This is the pons and then the medulla oblongata, fourth ventricle worm. So this relationship of vermis with the brainstem is extremely important to understand, which gives a lot of information in evaluating uh, or identifying abnormalities of the worms. Now, coming to the shape of the fourth ventricle and location of fourth ventricle parietal plexus. Uh, there is a wonderful article that has been published in 2021 by Walpe et al where they have described the fourth ventricle as a rectangular in shape in axial view, as well as in the kernel view. The size of the lateral vent fourth ventricle is lateral to lateral diameter is more than the AP diameter. This is an extremely important thing that you need to understand. This is the lateral to lateral diameter, which can be identified in axial as well as the kernel views. This is the AP diameter. It is always important to identify that the lateral to lateral diameter of the fourth ventricle is larger than that of the AP diameter of the fourth ventricle then you get what is called as the, uh, the, the uh, ventricular index, fourth ventricular index. It should be no more than one. If it is less than one, it indicates that there is a severe vermian dysgenesis. Not only that, the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. As you can see here, this is the normal choroid plexus. You can see the fourth ventricle. You can see the, the choroid plexus uh, being, uh, having a horizontal and a, and a vertical limbs which can be seen very clearly and which is seen abutting the, the fourth ventricular wall. Whenever you find that the, the choroid plexus are seen um, superior medially, that is superior um, and, up, and the upward displaced with a cystic area in the posterior fossa, it is a classical description of a Blake sport cyst. Whenever you find these choroid plexus within the cyst, you call it as a Blake sport cyst, 
whenever you find these parotid plexus outside the cyst, you call it, it is it's most probably a vermian hypoplasia. Now, uh, 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 not only that, whenever you have the, uh, the fourth ventricle choroid plexus outside, not only that it could be a dandiococcal malformation, but also a vermian hypoplasia. So these are, these are some factors which we have to keep in mind while evaluating the fourth ventricle, I mean, the, the vermis. Now, vermian morphology, biometry, and location are the three most common important factors which we need to consider while evaluating vermian abnormalities. If this is, vermis is the one which bridges the cerebellar hemispheres. It has 11 lobes, two fissures, and three functional parts. The three functional parts are the vestibulocerebellar part, which controls the eye movement, spinocerebellar portion, which contain, uh, controls the fine-tuned body and limb movements, cerebellocerebellar part, which, uh, uh, which contributes to planning, initiation, and timing of the movements. So these are the factors that we have to keep in mind. And uh, vermian biometry, the size of the vermis can be evaluated in what is called as the craniocaudal vermian diameter or the AP diameter, that is the, the vermian, uh, the prestigium to the vermian diameter as well as the vermian area. As they change or dependent with the gestational age, we take into consideration the bipedal diameter and the ratio is calibrated. If the vermian area or by BPD ratio is 1.1 is the normal cutoff. If it is more than 1.1, it is basically we are dealing with the Blake's forces, whereas if it is less than 1.1, we are dealing with the vermian hypoplasia. Why have you, why, why did we depend on this? Because Previously, we used to uh, use what is called as the brainstem vermis angle, but then this brainstem vermis angle, there was a lot of uh, overlap, and that's the reason why this has been designed in order to identify the brain and uh, um, uh, vermian abnormalities. This is the classical appearance of the vermis, where you can see the, the lobules, that is the superior fissure, and that is the vermia with the fastigium, with the apex of the fastigium. And when you take the diameter, the craniocaudal diameter, AP diameter, and then the area of the vermis. So these are the things that we take as far as the phenotype. The present thinking is that whenever we have a vermin area by BPD, the cutoff is 1.1. Anything less than 1.1 is considered as a vermin hypoplasia or a malformation. Presence of fourth ventricle parietal plexus up in plague spout cyst, whereas it is down in vermin hypoplasia as well as the dandiopalp malformation. Now, coming to the location of the vermis, basically it has been decided, I mean, um, depended upon the brainstem vermis angle. There is a line drawn along the posterior aspect of the brainstem and a line drawn along the dorsal uh, ventral aspect of the vermis. That gives the brainstem vermis angle. And uh, the normal is about 20 degrees, Blake's spot cyst. So these are the various angles that have been described. But unfortunately, if you take into consideration, there is a lot of overlap between the vermin hypoplasia and plague spots, as you can see here. So this is the dandy walker where it is almost 60 degrees, uh, whereas in the vermin hypoplasia and the down uh, plague spots, it is almost corresponding to 35 to 40 degrees. And that's the reason why now we depend more on the vermin area there rather than the angle. The other angles that have been de designed in order to evaluate the location of the vermis. So basically, the reason why we need to look for the location of the vermis is because most of the abnormalities, like for example, a dandivock malformation or a Blake's forces, there is a rotation of the vermis. So the, the location of the vermis will definitely tell us whether it is rotated or not rotated. Based on that, you can come to a diagnosis of the vermin abnormality. Now, the other angles that have been described are what are called as the tentorium, uh, tento, uh, uh, tento over in main angle, that is the TV angle, tento vermian angle, or the clevo vermian angle. This is the tentorium, that is the clivus, that is the vermian. So, this angle is called as the tento vermian angle, this angle is called as the cavo vermian angle. Normally, the tento vermian angle opens posteriorly whereas the clavo vermin angle opens anteriorly. So these are the things that can also help us in coming to a conclusion regarding the, the abnormalities of the vermis. As, is, as I've already described to you, this is the, the, fourth, I mean the, the fourth ventricle as well as the vermis and the trans distance that can be calibrated and assessed whether there is a megasystem magna or not. Then coming to the vermin abnormalities, we have the vermin hypoplasia, small vermis, 
Blake's Palsis, Dandy Walker malformation, Jobert syndrome, where we have the Blake's Palsis. Basically, we all know that Blake's pouch is a normal variant that invaginates after 12 weeks of gestation so that the fourth ventricle communicates with the cystern amygdala. Whereas uh, whenever the, it, it, this in, in imagination is uh, uh, restricted, then what happens is there will be a finger-like projection which develops into a blade sport cyst. So basically what happens is because there is a fluid collection in the posterior fossa, it moderately rotates the vermis upwards. Not only that, there will be what is called as the, the, uh, the fourth ventricle parietal plexus is located superior laterally within the cyst and the uh, fluid in the Blake's pouch is usually clear when compared to the fluid in the cistern amygdala, which is corpus collated because it's a sub subdermoid space. Now, this is the classical appearance of uh, Bla Blake's pouches. This is the depth of the cistern amygdala. You can see here beautifully the, that is the Blake's pouch, which is clean, clearly, and the cyst uh, Blake's pouches, which is clean, and the parietal plexus are seen superior medially. Now, this is the, the mild rotation of the, the worm is with a large cystic space occupying tissue, which is communicating with the fourth ventricle, which is basically Blake's pulses. Now, coming to the vermian hyperplasia, the in vermian hyperplasia, basically the vermian area to bipedal diameter is less than 1.1. This is the most important thing that is the normal landmarks, that is the vestigium as well as the primary fissure, cannot be identified because there is a hyperplasia. So, part of the vermis is, uh, no, uh, is, is not there, and that is the reason why we'll have what is called as the, the, the normal landmarks are obliterated. The tentorium will be normal because there is no rotation of the vermis, so there is no, uh, not much of a rotation of the vermis, so the, the tentorium is not elevated, and the fourth ventricle of the choroid plexus will be in lateral position. Now, this is a classical appearance where you can see this is the sagittal section. You can see the worm is almost small worm is which is seen, and the area is definitely less. Not only that, you are not able to see the primary fissure nor the vermin, uh, the vestigium. So there is obliteration, which indicates that is it. And not only that, here you can see that the choroid plexus are inferior laterally placed, which is very, very typical of a uh, vermin hyperplasia. Now, coming to the dandy walker malformation, actual view shows a V-shaped fourth ventricle, elevated tentorium, that is the torcular hydrophily, as well as the small vermis, uh, where the vermin ratio becomes less than 1.1, choroid plexus is low down. Uh, so this is the typical appearance there where we have a wide V-shaped uh, posterior fossa, that is the fourth ventricle, rat tail appearance of the worm is elevated uh, fourth ventricle and inferior lateral portion of the, the, the position of the choroid plex of the fourth ventricle. Jowbert's difficult to diagnose antenatally, but then we have what is called as the molar tooth appearance. Basically, this is because of uh, worm, severe vermin agenesis in which there will be a deep interpedicular fossa. This vermin tooth is basically because of deep interpedicular fossa and the roots are of the uh, pedicle are, are, are due to thickened superior cerebellar pedicles. So this is the classical appearance of uh, uh, Jobert syndrome where you have a classical deep uh, interpedicular fossa, thick superior pedicles uh, and a elongated fourth ventricle and a molar tooth appearance, which is very, very typical of a uh, Jobert syndrome. Now, rhombencephalosynopsis, this could be a complete or partial agenesis of vermis. And whenever there is a complete, uh, there is a severe agenesis, there is agenesis of vermis and in partial, there will be small nodular vermis. What we can see is instead of having a figure of eight appearance of the cerebellum, it becomes triangular and the AP diameter of fourth ventricle will be increased. Now, the key messages which I want to deliver because in order to, the factors which are considered for, to overcome the myths in the diagnosis of vermin disorders are open fourth ventricle, which could be a keyhole, small V or large V shape, fourth ventricle morphology and biometry, that is the ventricular index, and the location of the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle, superior lateral with the Blake's cyst, inferior lateral with vermian hyperplasia and antibacter malformation, vermian morphology, distorted vermis, vestigium, and the primary fissure cannot be identified, ratio of vermian area will be less than 1.1 in hyper hyperplasia, whereas it is more than 1.1 in Blake's pouch cyst. Location of the worm is rotated in Blake's pouch as well as the vermian hyperplasia and elevated tentorium in dandy walk morphology. I think these are the factors which we need to concentrate. And these factors are the ones which are going to answer our six questions which I have posted at the beginning of the talk, which helps us to break the myth 
and identify vermin disorders. Just to in a tabular form where we can see the abnormality, we can see whether there is a lateral ventricular megaly which is there or not, and then this, how, what is the nature of the cystina magna, area of the vermis, vermian rotation, tentorium, location of the fourth ventricle choroid flexors, and BV angle. So these are all the factors which are considered in order to identify vermian abnormalities. Thank you very, very much for your patience listening. Uh, Subraji, sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Praveen, for your lucid presentation. So you can go for the chat box for any questions. I think... Uh, uh, I think thank you. Uh, thank you, all the speakers, for all those wonderful talks which have left, uh, left all of us spellbound and will definitely be motivated uh, to push our boundaries and uh, fetal imaging and uh, seek for more knowledge. And uh, so we'll move, uh, move on for the uh, Q&A session. We have quite a few, a few questions for uh, Dr. Bimal Sahani, sir, first. Uh, sir, uh, what does progressive ventriculomegaly mean? How much should be the increased and what should be the duration between the, between the measurements? There is, there is no, you know, there is no criteria on how much it should be. But as long as if it is progressing, so mild becoming moderate, moderate becoming over, that itself we will call it as progression. And, uh, you know, see, anyway, uh, the duration, there is no criteria, but routinely as, you know, we don't go about looking at uh, it weekly. We normally try to give it a three to four weeks gap between two uh, examinations. Thank you, sir. Another question. Uh, is there any uh, significance for mentioning the size of a choroid flexus cyst? Uh, see, uh, it, it doesn't uh, matter because usually they're going to disappear by about 24 uh, to 26 weeks of uh, gestation. But then, yes, see, that we love some quantification to everything. And so when I'm putting it, uh, in the body of my report, I will always say, yes, the size measured so and so. But as such, uh, small, large, uh, do not make too much of a difference as far as its significance is concerned. Unless it's very large and then that is causing ventriculomegaly in the sense, because if the cyst diameter itself is around 12 to 14 millimeter, then yes, the ventricle also would be dilated. But, but we do mention uh -huh. the size. Yes, I sir. think Pravinsa uh, wants think. to add some things. Pardon? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, there is one paper that has been published in the White Journal recently by Melinger et al. Uh, Gasso, where they have said that a, a choroid plexus cyst, which is more than 10 millimeters in diameter, needs to be reevaluated and followed up because. These are the ones which are associated with uh, certain uh, 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 increased incidence of uh, chromosomal abnormalities. Not only that, there is an increased incidence of choroid plexus abnormalities that is in the form of a choroid plexus tumors. So this is recently published in, I think, if I, I don't remember the exact date, but then it is in 2021 or 2020 journal, uh, white journal that has been published. So not that every time we try to evaluate or measure the choroid plexus size, but then whenever it is very large, definitely I think it is not. And that has to be differentiated from what is called as the cyst arising from the floor of the uh, lateral ventricles instead of a cyst arising in, in the choroid plexus. So these are the things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, uh, sir, sorry. can I just add one more? Uh, please, please, please. Thing. So regarding the choroid plexus cyst, if you see an increase of three millimeters in uh, in a span of three weeks, they say it is significant. I, I really don't know, but then this is the. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, I'm not sure. Do this you, is uh, one of is the books the... Dr. Poo has written in the fetal neurosonography that when yes. we are uh, calling them for a, re a review scan, at the minimum uh, weeks we need to call them is at a three weeks interval. And if the difference between the previous scan and the subsequent scan is uh, more than or equal to three millimeters, that means it is a significant increase and it is progressive. Right. 
Okay. That is for ventriculomegaly or choroid plexus cyst? Ventriculomegaly, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ventriculomegaly. Uh, because you said oh, choroid plexus cyst. Yeah, we are talking about choroid plexus cyst. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, 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 okay. I'm just... Uh, yeah, 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 the yeah, the yeah. other question. The audience should take a proper message. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The choroid, because choroid plexus, plexus cyst, cyst, if we see, we don't ask for a... You know, especially if they're less than 10 millimeter, we do, normally do not ask for a review for yes. a measurement of yes. That's, 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 that's what I say. Three three weeks is the minimum that you need to give between two examinations to look for any progression in ventriculomegaly. So can you please demonstrate the location of choroid plexus in the posterior fossa anomalies? The images you used were axial images. How to label superolateral and inferolateral in axial planes, sir? To uh, Dr. Praveen, no. sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the superior lateral and inferior lateral, you cannot label them in axial planes because axial plane is uh, one thing where you are not identifying the superior and inferior aspects of the posterior fossa. It is in the coronal plane that you can identify the superior and inferior parts. When you take the coronal section, particularly involving the posterior fossa, including the cerebellar hemispheres, where you can demonstrate the fourth ventricle, the communication with the cisterna magna, that is the point where you can see the choroid plexus, which are, uh, uh, part of it is horizontally placed, part of the two limbs are uh, vertically placed. So these horizontally placed ones are the opens into the cisterna magna, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, foramen of Magindi, whereas the lateral vertical parts are the ones which open into the cerebellopontane uh, angles, where it is called as the foramen of Lushka. So the choroid plexus uh, configuration or um, uh, the way they are projected is only in the coronal section, not in the axial, not in the sagittal sections. Thank you, sir. Am I uh, clear? Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So which, uh, which chart would you recommend for Vermian morphometry in daily practice? Uh, there is nothing, I mean, there are a lot of normogram charts that are available as far as the Vermian size is concerned. But then the consensus today is that we don't really take much, give much importance to the AP and the CC, that is the cranial order. But the area of the vermis is the one which give you, give, uh, we give a lot of importance to it rather than the CC and the AP. And even for the area of vermis also, there are normogram charts. The, how to differentiate between uh, aqueductal stenosis and agenesis of corpus callosum? And uh, in ACC, whether ventriculomegaly is the cause or the effect of ACC? Uh, to Dr. Bimal yeah, 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 yeah. Ventriculomegaly is, uh, you know, uh, is because of the ACC, but ACC is not without, you know, is, I think I read the question. It is whether this is happening because of the uh, ACC or ACC is happening because of ventriculomegaly. ACC does not happen. It is like uh, egg and the chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then uh, the, <laughs> once there is an ACC, basically what you get is colpocephaly. You get the occipital and post, the posterior horns which are uh, dilated. And uh, so that is an association, but not necessarily every time that you will get. Uh, uh, ventriculomegaly with ACC. Sometimes uh, the diameter may not be very high, but then you get a spindle-shaped uh, ventricle. So primarily you have the frontal horns, which are very, very pinched. As far as difference between ACC and uh, aqueductal stenosis, there is, there is a huge difference between the two. As when you, the ventriculomegaly that you get with aqueductal stenosis is overall the ventricles are dilated. In ACC, you get uh, colpocephaly, that is the posterior horns. Then you will have uh, uh, the corpus callosum would be abnormal in aqueductal stenosis, where, yes, so primarily, you know, all these other findings that you see are all indicative, supportive, indirect signs. But for making a diagnosis of ACC, we're going to go directly into a mid sagittal and look at the corpus callosum directly. And so once you don't have the corpus callosum, you have a diagnosis of ACC that's there. Thank you, sir. Yeah. sir uh, this question is to Dr. Hurana, yeah. sir. Sir, there are comments saying that your talk is just like watching a sci-fi movie. 
so when we can see so much on ultrasound itself so is there really a need for mri if so in which cases would we recommend a fetal mri wonderful <clears throat> i wanted that question actually um there are increasing indications for a good mri in order to prognosticate findings when we find them on ultrasound we know that the findings that we have on ultrasound are not necessarily a diagnosis and uh, for instance a genesis of the corpus callosum is a label of an anatomical abnormality and to find out what is the cause of this and what are the implications of the type of a genesis of the corpus callosum uh, we would need to find out whether the fibers of the corpus callosum are connecting correctly some fibers in the corpus callosum end in symmetrical areas and some would end in asymmetric areas and for some it doesn't matter whether they are asymmetric you will still have a good prognosis so there are increasing utilities of this and it's still in the realm of research and statistics but there is no doubt that um, in terms of giving a structure the aspect of a the possibility of a genetic underlying uh, problem or the final prognosis we would depend a lot on a well done mri um, and preferably on a 3 tesla unit we also have now uh, the permission from the fda to use 5 and 7 tesla units uh, which are difficult to use technically but which overcome a lot of the motion artifacts and we have one of these in place here in delhi where we have permission to use this as part of a experimental protocol and we're getting some fascinating early results so uh, really it's a situation which is evolving we in fact have a society of field medicine series on the increasing role of mri and we meet on the third monday of every month we usually have either very distinguished indian faculty or an international faculty and for more answers to this you can be with us um, it's it's a program that is free of cost Uh, for all members of the society field medicine yeah, third, third monday third monday thank you sir so with this we come to the end of the uh, a very enriching evening i request dr madhavali tamam to uh, please present the word of thanks Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank Dr. Ashok Kurana sir, Praveen sir, and uh, Bimal Sahani sir for their tireless efforts to uh, increase or take fetal medicine into obstetrics practice to nook and corner of the country. And not only today, Ashok Kurana sir, you will be uh, you know you you should accept great a uh, heartfelt uh, gratitude and thanks from all of us and. the next generations to come and for being an icon of inspiration to the uh, future generations and i thank our uh, uh, chair persons today who in spite of their busy schedule and at this time of they are still uh, uh, giving us the support and the strength for us to go forward and just for being there sajna ma'am radha ma'am and subhraju sir and i thank the trade partners for being uh, for making this uh, program uh, go uh, so well and thank uh, dr shri devi for taking the initiative and it's a, such a big responsibility to uh, even have the thought of i know okay we can do this and have a chapter and uh, make so many people uh, stay together in one place and uh, thank you uh, mr vishal i feel he is like pujari of a temple of society of fetal medicine where he is the access to <laughs> access to the gods who are present in this in this society and thank you vishal for being there uh, for any for every small thing and for every small meeting and last but not the least the audience Uh, more than i think uh, more than 250 uh, have been uh, present and have made this uh, uh, meeting very interactive session and once again uh, thank you ashok kurana sir for establishing a platform like this where fetal medicine has become uh, and now everybody knows about fetal medicine e even today actually there are some super specialists who don't know what fetal medicine is but still i'm sure uh are uh, practicing obstetricians and it has come to the software people and even lay people are knowing watching videos on uh, fetal reductions etc and coming to us thank you sir thank you very much thank you and congratulations thank to you. all of you
for it's always a good program today. Congratulations. And, and, and all so the thank you once again for giving us your, your valuable time on a working day, sir, and being with us so late in the night. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed.